guys welcome back to John's workshop and in this video we're going to go on to part three of the shaper refurb so if you watched part one and two you'll have seen me strip the machine down in part two you'll have seen me make the dolly so that I can make it mobile in part three we're going to make good use of that we're going to get the thing outside the garage we're going to get the wire wheel set up and we're going to rip off all of that nasty paintwork that's on the shaper body and on the base and then we're going to proceed with some final disassembly of one or two bits and pieces and then we're going to give the inside of the shaper body itself where the ball gear sits and all the shafting a really good clean out because that's absolutely filthy in there and full of swarf so we're going to clean all that up and then I think that's everything on there uh, yep paint strip clean out oh I just want to point out so I'm calling this an Atlas 7B shaper and I'm going to refer to that every time I put a video out it's not an Atlas 7B this is an Acorn tool shaper and it's not the same thing albeit it's very very similar to an Atlas so I'm calling it Atlas because there's lots of people with Atlas 7Bs out there there's probably two or three people with an Acorn tool shaper they're very very rare uh, it was the UK version I think and um, it, it's uh, it's probably a clone of some description of the Atlas 7B but incredibly similar in fact it uses some common parts that were made under license by uh, with Atlas at some point I don't really know the history so I'm going to refer to it as Atlas because there'll be lots of people with Atlas shapers that may find this interesting in some form or another or may not so and then right at the end uh, viewer participation so what's that all about you have to wait to the end I'll don't skip to the end just to find that bit we'll get there when when we get there so I'll bring you back at the end of the video and we'll have a little discussion and then that will be the end of this episode Well, that is a noisy, messy old job, and do what I say, not what I do. So before the health and safety police come and arrest me, I know I did the start of that without any gloves on, and also I've got a t-shirt on, shouldn't be doing that. should have all your skin covered completely in something robust, preferably a leather apron if you've got one because when you're using wire wheels like that, especially in a, in a angle grinder, the speed they're going at, if those wires come loose, which a few did, and st stuck through my legs and things like that, you just need to be as protected as you can. They are very, very dangerous things, a wire wheels. So gloves on, and I was wearing gloves for the remainder of it, and get yourself totally covered up as much as you can. So health and safety tip out of the way we have got a 90% solution with what I've done there just with that one wire wheel it's taken about an hour so it's been a hard work a hard hours graft but it's taken about an hour to get to this state so there's a few little bits and bobs where I can't get the wire wheel in so I'm just going to resort, resort to the DeWalt with a smaller wire wheel and I can do that in the workshop don't need to move it again for that they're only little bits and bobs and a few of the bits around the back where the motor brackets are still on just need to have a bit of a go around there 
but largely fairly pleased with that it's come up it's come up nicely it needs a bit more finishing off as I said and a good degrease and then the next job really I've got to get it back out of the dolly I've got to do just around the bottom perimeter of it clean the dolly out paint around the bottom not quite sure how I'm going to do that I'm probably going to drop it on some wooden chocks again for now to, while I get that bit done and then I can paint the dolly at the same time and then once all that's dry I can then drop it back in the dolly and from that point on it can stay in the dolly while I do the rest of the degreasing and painting I've also got work to do you know I've done nothing on these slideways yet so these need that's probably what I'm going to do first is clean all the engineering surfaces up properly mask them off and then so they're masked ready for painting so I will bring you back during elements of that what I don't know what I'm going to do yet is whether to just get everything wire wheeled you know I've got all the the ram to do the belt guards there's all the little bits and pieces need paint off in the same way or whether I do this piecemeal and I think I'm more inclined to want to do it piecemeal so I'll get the base complete finished painted and then I can then work on the individual bits and pieces one at a time just so that this doesn't become too tedious of doing lots and lots of the same stuff so that's probably what we're going to do so I'll bring you back in a bit when we're doing the next bit of whatever we're doing on here just tidying the final bits up okay so I came to take the final piece off the main casting ahead of paint so during the rub down and this was bolted to the back of the machine the back of the casting and this is where the, mo the motor plate sits through and this screw here is the adjuster for the belt tension and we have found our first casualty of this machine can anybody spot it I'll help you it's there so unfortunately as I took the mounting screw the two mounting screws off that hold this in place it was evident very quickly that this is cracked and looks like it's been cracked for quite some time because there's some rust in the cast faces where the cracks are so it isn't something fortunately that I've done this is something that's been in place for quite some time why is it cracked? I don't know whether this is design flaw or whether this you know I don't know if this is original design or whether somebody's modified this in some way or other I don't think they have it doesn't look to be machined or they're all as cast faces other than this back face but when you look at the the wall thickness and the sharp corners that this has got around this kind of stress point where this adjuster is you can see there's not a lot of wall thickness and that's what's caused this to crack uh, as well as probably somebody being too heavy handed with um, a spanner at some point putting too much force on or it could have been that the machine's been knocked or bumped while it's had the motor on the back you know the whole host of reasons could have caused that that presents me with a particular problem um, I've got you know this is cast iron I've got some oxypropane gear here now which should be capable of fixing this when I say should I think it would only be my limitations that would stop that you know I've never done anything with cast iron so um, and would I put my faith in trying to fix this and if you look at where it's cracked and there's more cracks as well down this side of this boss so this this whole boss is cracked around it so that would need to you know that would need to be ground back out and try to fill down in tight places down there I just know I'm not going to be successful with that um, I, I just don't have the confidence to attack that with the stuff I've got and make a good job of it if I've got a TIG welder and some silicon bronze rods I might be more I might be yeah again I've never done it so I'd still be 
lacking in confidence, but I might be more tempted to have a go. But yeah, I'm just not. I just I'm just not going to fix that. I don't think I don't have the skills or the or the right gear or the experience to make that work. So, what does all that mean? It means I need to find or make a replacement. Now, I'm not going to find a replacement. Highly doubtful I'm going to be able to get one of these things on a machine of this age. So that means I need to make a replacement. So fairly straightforward from a fabrication perspective really. So I'm going to get this measured up but I'm going to do that in a separate video um, as a tips video and it will probably be coming in my next tips video. I know I promised that I was going to do push off on the lathe but I think we're going to move that out and do this first. I've got this to do and I've also got a collet that I need to measure up in my engraving machine both for my own purposes and for somebody else. So I think what we're going to do is do a how do you reverse engineer a product type tips video and how would you how would I attack this from a measuring this up ordering steel planning around how I'm going to make it and also measuring up a very very small collet that's quite difficult to measure and some thinking around that so I might do a kind of reverse engineering tips type video around this particular piece in particular as we measure this up and get some steel ordered to fabricate something that looks as close to this as possible but made from made from steel. So we're making a start on the slideways now cleaning things up ahead of paint so I've got I've done all of the rubbing down that I'm going to do around this top section at least so we're good now to start cleaning up these slideways so I've done this one and this one's come up fine there is a bit of a gouge in it there's a couple of little tiny gouges in it but there's no raised edges we've been over that with a flat oil stone after we'd cleaned all the the muck off it so we've done front side you know, front face side face and back face and they're all the three location faces i've also done this piece at the bottom here now, this piece was quite interesting if you think how this works You've got your cube table on here with a foot underneath it that sits on this plate and as your traverse goes along that foot just rides on this on this surface. Now interestingly even from cast, well I think from casting because there's no machining marks or relatively modern machining marks on this face there was burrs almost around the edge edges of these kind of sharp edges on the casting some slightly proud and it's not through wear, um, definitely not through wear and what I found is as I was cleaning this up there was about four or five high spots along its length and almost quite uniformly pitched high spots so what they would have had the effect of doing if you've got your foot locked off and everything's tight as you wind across and your foot's travelling across there and it hits a high spot it's going to force or try and force the table upwards which is going to affect the accuracy of any surface that you're creating on the top of the table so what we've done is we have cleaned it up we've taken the burrs off around the edges and we've oil stoned this until we've removed the high spots I've yet to get some form of a DTI on there um, to check that but I'm, I'm a lot more confident in it now than I was when I first saw it so Good enough for now. Done this one as I said. Just going to start work on this side. So this is really gummy, sticky, horrible, covered in muck. So how I'm doing them, and I'm not going to show you all of it. Tiny bit of WD-40, and we're just starting with some green Scotch Brite. Basically, just rubbing over the surface, just to remove the worst of the sticky sticky mess and I often get asked questions around the use of scotch bright not only just on YouTube but also and probably more so in my past in industry and people say oh you shouldn't really do that because you're gonna especially on a machine bedway like this you're gonna you're gonna put divots in it you're gonna put unevenness into it because you're not, you know, you're not, I'm just using my fingers, I'm not using something flat, I'm not pressing on hard, 
This is green scotch bright. I could rub away at that all day long with this bit of scotch bright, and I'd be lucky if I took three or four microns off it. So, will it remove a tiny bit of material? Probably. I mean, you can see where I've been rubbing there. There's no real evidence of black cast iron in the scotch bright. So, you know, don't be afraid to use green scotch bright like this on a dirty slideway just to get rid of the, the oil and sticky stuff and clean things up a bit. You are not going to do any damage. Absolutely not. So that's the job. I'll switch the camera off, carry on with that, get it all cleaned up and then the final job is to run over that with the oil stone. Make sure there's no high spots from any dings or divots. I'll bring you back when I'm doing that. Okay, so <clears throat> a few minutes with the Scotch Bright, and we've cleaned that slide way up. You can probably see the reflection on there. The lighting's not brilliant, but that's cleaned up lovely. We've got all the grime and horribleness, stickiness off that. What we're now going to do is just run over that with an oil stone. Now, this isn't a precision ground flat stone, this is an India oil stone, it's two sided, rough and smooth. We're only concerned with the smooth side. This has only ever been used, well, since I've had it and I bought it new old stock. This has only ever been used for slideways and I don't use it for anything else. So I'm fairly happy that this surface is as well as flat as it was when it came from the factory. And when you're doing anything like this, each time you do it, you need to Make sure you wash your oil stone off. Now you can use brake cleaner, you can use WD-40, you can use a whole range of things, but I always use my finger. A bit dirty, but in using your finger with that liquid on there, you can feel if there's anything foreign on that surface, foreign body on that surface, like bits of dust, bits of grit, loose bits of grit from the stone, bits of swarf, whatever. And when you're happy that, that surface is clean, it's as simple as I'm going to put that onto the onto the slideway and literally all I'm doing is just rubbing over that very lightly and I'm feeling for any drag which would suggest there's a high spot somewhere and I'm not feeling anything. Therefore, I'm going to leave well enough alone. I'm going to do the same on the side. A bit harder because there's not such a square surface, so I'm just going to take my time with that. Make sure I keep the stone flat to the surface. Trying to use the whole face of the stone so that I don't end up wearing any unevenness into the surface of the stone. Can't feel any drag on there. That's it. I'm not touching that anymore. That's as good as it needs to be. Just get a bit of paper towel now. And give that a wipe. And that's a, something that I've, I'm sort of used to from, I guess, my apprenticeship days. Very um, used to tactile sort of feel. It is no different when you're putting parallels in a vise. You're cleaning a vise base out. You're on a granite surface table and you're cleaning that, making sure that's clean before you put a a clock unit on it, whatever. You'll see people with an airline 
and that's probably good enough for some people. You'll see people use something like this that they've had kicking around, could have anything on it. Doesn't tell you anything. I do that and assume that's clean. I can just by doing that I can see there's a tiny speck of blue paper left behind there just just by looking at it. And so so as a tip, get used to get used to using your fingers. They tell you an awful lot about what's going on, especially when you're putting parallels in a vice or as I said, going onto a granite surface table, doing a job like this. I don't even need to look at this slideway. The feedback I'm getting through my fingertips is telling me everything I need to know about that surface. So yeah, just a tip f to get more in touch with whatever it is you're doing using these. They can tell you an awful lot and it's it's a really it's one of the most useful things, especially where cleanliness and precision is required. There's nothing better than these to tell you whether something's clean or not. Okay, excuse the handheld, we're going in. The time has now come to address this dirty, oily, greasy swarf. Lots and lots of bits of swarf in here, packed in. So there is absolutely no way you guys are going to see anything while I'm doing this because my hands are going to be in the way the whole time but you can see what we're up against but fortunately my masking that I did with the cardboard has worked well this isn't full of flaky paint adding to the mess so I will bring you back I'm going to start at the top and work down with paintbrushes, toothbrushes, rags, WD-40, degreaser and whatever other tools and bits and pieces that I think we're going to need to clean this up. So I'll bring you back for a progress update when we're, when we're finished. So excuse the handheld once again, we're going in. So that's where we've got to. And the astute amongst you will notice that the primary shaft has now been taken out. So once I'd got everything cleaned up, that felt rough. I, on the initial inspection I thought it felt okay, but it, it felt a bit growly. So I've popped that out, they're good quality Tim can taper roller bearings. I'm going to clean them all out, re-grease them, see what they feel like. It might have just been a bit too much preload. There was quite a lot put on there. So there you can see that is now much better than it was. So I'm still not intending to take this unit out and the bearings that sit within it because that does feel really nice nice and smooth there's no noises there's no grumbling or growling there's just some old grease 
that's inside there and what I'm going to try and do is set my grease gun up and we're going to, when we've taken this masking tape off we're just going to pump lots of new grease through there and I think it's only going to come out this way I think we'll try it and see what happens and see if we can flush the manky grease that's in there out and replace it with some fresh but there's certainly nothing in there that's rumbling or growling so I'm not inclined to want to take that apart really albeit it's probably the only bit that I've not took off so there we have that in a much better state so we're about to start ordering up paint and for that bit I'm going to bring you back to the board and we will close this episode out well there we go guys that gets us to the end of part three of the shaper refurb quite a messy job quite a lot of work has gone into that to get to that state I'm quite happy with that now and we're almost at the point now where everything from this point onwards is either clear, you know, putting new on or cleaning the final bits down. I've got obviously more wire wheeling to do and stuff of all the individual parts but they're much smaller going to be much easier to cope with than the big thing. So as I said in the video I think um, I, I've got a bit of a decision to make. Do I just do everything to the same standard before I start and or do I crack on with that base unit and get that finished to a, a level and then we'll piecemeal the parts on just to try and make this a bit more interesting so I'm not doing hours and hours and hours of the same stuff and when I say interesting more, more so for me than, than for you guys because I'll try and mix these videos up a bit anyway to so it doesn't get too tedious so viewer participation this is it's your chance to <laughs> have a say in what this thing is going to look like when it's finished so I uh, you may have noticed this from my channel graphics and various other things orange is my favorite color the seat that i'm sat on i'll just show a clip of that that was painted by me it's uh i think it's a kubota orange it's an industrial uh agricultural paint color i like that color i like orange and i like orange and gray together they're two of my favorite colors um and my <laughs> my heart wants me to paint this shaper that nice orange colour because I like it. My head tells me not to do that because that's really silly and stupid and machines should just all be dull and boring and grey uh, or dark green or something similar. So, and I really can't decide and I've made some hints towards this in previous videos and we've had a bit of a laugh in some of the comments and so it's your chance to decide it's the viewership is going to decide what colors we paint this within a range obviously i'm not i'm not going to open this up wide so there are three options okay so option one is we paint the whole thing that orange color that you've just seen that's the base the machine and everything that goes on it and i have a very bright orange machine uh, which i would i'd be okay with that personally option two is we paint the whole thing dark grey as it was probably meant to be or certainly the atlases were meant to be originally I think the acorns were that green colour that you've seen me taking off that horrible oh it's awful I'm sure other people might like it but I don't so we paint the whole machine a nice dark grey and, and much darker than the grey that was on it uh, I'd be okay with that and option three is we do a mix of those two things and we paint the cast iron base dark grey and we paint the machine on the top orange so there are your three options all orange all grey or grey base orange machine so there's options there probably to suit everybody's tastes hopefully um, and we're going to do all of that through YouTube comments so everybody can see the results there's nothing hidden in emails or anything like that it's far easier for me to manage it through YouTube comments than it is managing lots of emails on this it's your chance to decide guys and if there's a tiebreaker my dog decides which one we're going to do and I'll film that and and then I take no responsibility at all for what this finishes up looking like so if somebody complains in the future 
you've only got yourselves to blame. So that's the way we're going to do it. I hope that's going to be a bit of fun. And I'm sure we might get one or two silly answers of pink and other things. But no, it is just those three options. So number one, all orange. Number two, all grey. Number three, grey base, orange machine. You decide. And on that note, we're going to wrap this episode up. I'm really looking forward to seeing the feedback we get from this. And it's your machine. You're going to be watching it working. So choose wisely. And with all that being said, we will catch you all very soon on another video when we'll be making something else.